Today's brief has been created with open source information readily available on the internet as well as books. However, take it with a pinch of salt because some aspects have been kept secret due to said country's official secrets act. And sometimes Wikipedia is probably the best place to find the information. So sit back, relax, and let's get into today's briefing. Before we start today's video, I'd like to give a small shout out to SaveTheRawNavy.org, an amazing website run by some good people who make high quality articles and graphics for information on the Royal Navy of today. It's a very informative place and without one of their articles on the development of the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers, today's video would not actually be made. Apart from that, they have let me use some of their images, so they will be images of said ships with the Save the Royal Navy.org logo in the corner to show that was theirs. So let's get started with the development of the Queen Elizabeth class supercarriers. After the Falklands War, the Royal Navy possessed three light aircraft carriers of the Invincible class, designed around anti-submarine warfare for NATO task groups. But the approach of the new millennium and the coming about of the newly elected Labour government under Tony Blair, this would change its mindset to what the new aircraft carrier was going to do. British aircraft carriers then on will not conduct ASW as a main objective, and these new carriers would operate as a strike carrier, similar to along the lines of what the American Navy was doing with their Nimitz class carriers. It became apparent that the three Invincibles were too small for continuous strike operations, and by 1997, the Ministry of Defence was designing their potential replacements. The idea at the time was a much larger ship than the Invincibles, and operating a V-Stol aircraft, similar to that of the Harrier jump jet, even though at the time there were talks of developing and navalizing the Typhoon to operate from a carrier. But as this didn't come to fruition, the V-Stol idea was brought back. However, there were designs for creating an enlarged Invincible design. However, that would be quickly shelved due to the design being too old and would lack the beam to operate large strike aircraft. In 1998, Tony Blair would initiate the SDSR of 1998, and this would announce that the carriers they would build would be 40,000 tonne vessels with about 50 aircraft and have two ships, with an in-service date of 2012. And so, the future aircraft carrier project was launched by the time I was actually born, in 1999, in January. And so, the organisation that would later become the Aircraft Carrier Alliance would lay down nine key user requirements for the ships to fulfil. So if all the points are hit, you kind of have a winning design. So designs would be drawn up by British Aerospace and TALIS. Their designs would need to include interoperability with joint and international operations, integration with future technology, the air group and command and control, availability to have one ship available for operations at any one time, deployability anywhere across the world, sustainability to conduct operations for long periods of time, the carrier must be able to deploy offensive air power without host nation support, survivability against damage, flexibility of operating the largest amount of aircraft, and versatility, being able to operate the widest amount of roles. So, no pressure, eh? There would be a couple of caveats to the designs, however. The ships should be built in Britain, they should be single-hulled, not be nuclear-powered, not have a massive crew, limiting to about 636 standard ships company. The designs would be split into two sections, Catobar and Stovel. Now, the scaling I'll be using for this section is that of a single F-35B Lightning II aircraft, which has a length of about 15.57 metres or 51.1 feet, to give an idea of exactly how big these ships would be. Catobar Design 1 would consist of an angled flight deck, two catapults, and elevators to the starboard side of the centerline, similar to that of the Invincible class aircraft carriers and most preceding British carrier designs. Based on the size of the F-35s on deck, the size of the ship is estimated to be about 300 metres long, with a beam of 77 metres. Catobar Design 2 would be very similar to that of Catobar Design 1, 
However, they would move the aircraft list to the starboard side, making them deck edge elevators, capable of taking two fighters each. This design is expected to be about 291 meters long with a 72 and a half meter beam. Catobar design three would be similar in overview to the Nimitz class aircraft carriers, now having one aircraft lift on the port side and one on the starboard side. The island has now been split in two, putting them very, very far to the far end of the ship. This design is just under 287 meters long and sporting a 70 meter beam. In terms of the short takeoff or vertical landing designs, Stovall 1 design would be similar in looks to the CVA-01 project from the 1960s. This vessel has a twin runway and what appears to be a large ski ramp at the front end, a large long island and two deck edge elevators on the starboard side, straddling the superstructure. This design appears to be about 278.21 meters long by a 61 meter beam. Stovall 2 design appears to be a modified Vikram Aditya class aircraft carrier design with the launching areas to the starboard side. The island is forward of amidships and the ship carries three just off centerline lifts, capable of lifting a single F-35. On the port side there is a landing area for the jet and this design is about 279 meters long and have a 60 meter beam. It is unknown if this ship is a flush deck or has a small ski ramp on the starboard side. Stovall design form would revert back to having two aircraft lifts on the starboard side. There would be two runways taken off from a Kuznetsov style ski ramp, but not as harsh. This design also has a split superstructure, and this design would be about 289 meters long and have a 67 and a half meter beam. Whilst these designs were being drawn up, the United Kingdom would join the Joint Strike Fighter program, and by 2002, the Stobar version of the designs would be deleted and they would progress with the Stovall designs. For tonnage wise, the Stovall version of whichever variation was about 10,000 tons lighter than its Katobar contemporaries. However, the best Stovall design was in the region of about 60,000 tons by this point, so it gives you an idea of just how much the Katobar would displace. By September of 2002, the design was confirmed to be an adaptable carrier, configured to have a ski ramp for Stovall but capable of being fitted with cats and traps at some point within the ship's careers, if needs be. So this requirement, the ship would have to be adaptable, and as such, she would require a full-length two-deck or gallery deck. The reason for this would be the compartments required to take the catapults, the blast deflector gear, as well as the arrestor gear. But in addition to this, the ship would have to be able to move weapons from the hangar and deep magazine to the gallery deck to be taken to the flight deck. This would require an increase in freeboard due to the requirement of the hangar to be about 30 feet or higher to accommodate the Royal Navy's standard helicopter complement. This increase in freeboard would require the beam at the waterline to be increased. This increase would allow the hangar to be larger and the lift could be pushed to the side of the ship, given an increase in complement for aircraft stored in the hangar deck. By December 2002, the two island design was in full effect with Talis and as such they would choose this design. Due to the better command and control of the ship from the forward island and better control of the air group from the aft island. And so latter designs would be drawn up following the two island design. Talis would be selected to design the ship, beating BAE systems in designing a better capable vessel. So we'll cover the BAE's design first as I think it's quite interesting. The design currently gracing your screens is BAE Systems Final Proposal. This is the BAE Systems CVF Proposal 2002. Now this design is a enhanced Catobar Design 2, but instead of having the two larger aircraft lifts, she actually sports three small lifts for one aircraft each. It has two catapults and a large island with a lift under the center section limiting the capabilities of what can actually be used from that lift. From observation of this concept, the Greyhound on the deck seems to be way too big for any of the lifts, even if the wings are folded back. Anyway, the ship appears to be fitted with four CRAM close-in weapon systems, and radar-wise, she looks to be sporting a four-side planier multifunctional radar atop of the large bridge, and possibly a 1045 on the aft tower. The design from Talis would be named Alpha, Bravo, Charlie and Delta, 
and these would be designed by Talis themselves and a subsidiary company, BMT. Design Alpha would be 295 meters long, have a 75 meter beam, 10 meter draft, and subdivided into 19 sections. She'd be a 73,000 ton ship and have 10 decks, and approximately 3,000 tons of armor. Yes, you have heard armor on a modern day aircraft carrier. Very surprising, hey? The design would be powered by four gas turbines, powering four azipods and two bow thrusters. Fixed wing complement would be 40 aircraft, capable of launching about 150 sorties a day. The carrier would have a full width ski ramp on the bow, similar to that of the Admiral Kuznetsov. The weapons appear to be consisting of three phalanx, a couple of 30mm ASCG mounts, and possibly multiple small arms. Strikingly, she would be fitted with a vertical launch silver Aster surface to air missile systems. Radar systems appear to be a 1045 multifunctional radar for the Aster and early warning targeting, 1046 early warning radar, and a handful of navigational radars. This design was to be the gold standard design for the company. However, it was deemed too expensive, and as such, they went back to the drawing board. The next design was the design Bravo. This would be a 265 meter long ship, displacing 55,000 tons and having 9 decks overall. This design would be powered by 2 gas turbines and 2 diesel engines, powering 2 5 bladed propellers and 2 bow thrusters. Fixed wing complement would consist of 34 aircraft, being able to produce 110 sorties per day. Radar fit appears to be a type 1045 multifunctional radar on the Florid Island, and what appears to be an octagonal mast cap with maybe four spy one emitters or some variation of a fixed multifunctional electronically active scanned array. As this design was a scale back and stripped down version of Design Alpha, the self defense weapons were ditched for only defense of off board decoy launchers. So much so, this design was shelved as it wasn't good enough for the Royal Navy and it pretty much wouldn't protect it itself. Design Charlie would pretty much be a copy of Design Bravo, however there is slight improvements. Improvements such as increased subdivision within inside the hull. In this design there would be now 19 different sections compared to on the other one which is about 12. The hull has been reshaped for increased stability and there has been the deletion of the bow thrusters which will now increase the fuel capacity of the ship for long distance durations. Design Delta is the prototype Queen Elizabeth class design. This design is a 65,000 ton aircraft carrier with a length of 280 meters, a beam of 75 meters and a draft of 10. This design would be powered by two Rolls-Royce gas turbines and four Valtzella diesel engines. Fixed wing complement would be about 36 and 110 sorties could be achieved over a 24 hour period. Weapon systems could be three Phalanx close-in weapon systems, a handful of 30mm ASCG mounts, and the radar fit would be a 1045 early warning tracking radar on the Farad Island, and what appears to be a domed radar emitter atop the Aft Island. However, note there is no main mast on the Aft Island. And by 2005, the Aircraft Carrier Alliance had stood up, and Design Delta had been chosen to advance. However, this would not be the final design. The Aircraft Carrier Alliance would investigate hull forms for speed, stability and survivability. Additionally, they would work on the skegs lengths, the rudder size, the transom stern flaps, as well as the design for the bulbous bow. However, by late 2006, the design had matured to what we more or less know today. However, some things would be removed and redesigned. In the same year as Design Delta was given the green light to go and mature the design, long lead items for the ships would be ordered. The gas turbines, the revolutionary integrated electric propulsion motors, propellers, as well as the propeller shafts. The two ships would be designed in an age where Lloyd's naval ship rules had changed, and standards would be improved in survivability and operation. In a cost-cutting meta, the Queen Elizabeth class carriers would try to use as much commercial off the shelf equipment as possible without affecting the fighting capability and over reliance on commercial equipment. HMS Ocean had come into service a few years earlier, but was built relatively cheap and had an over reliance on commercial equipment, 
and it showed in her operations and sustainability. By 2009, the final design was ready for construction. The class would sport a 16,000 meter square flight deck, all 3.9 acres, which was a very flexible deck for aircraft traffic, parking and operations. The gallery deck below on a two deck would keep the unallocated spaces for modification in later life to a catabar carrier, as they were believing they were still flirting around with the idea of turning this ship into a cats and traps capable vessel. In addition to this, the catapult compartment would be turned into a flat, the areas would be changed into offices, crew areas, as well as stores compartments. The hangar would be about 30 foot tall and be over 159 meters long by 23 meters wide. Total area is about 33,000 meters squared. The ship's propulsion would consist of about four Valtzilla 16 cylinder diesel engines and two Rolls Royce MT30 Trent gas turbines, producing power to four General Electric power conversion units, turning two large electrical motors for two shafts. Weapon systems for the ships would be three Phalanx close in weapon systems, located one port and one starboard at the bridge on Sponsons, and one on the aft quarter. Four 30mm ASC mounts are also slated to be fitted, two near the forward phalanx mount and two aft, all located on two deck. The final radar fit for the Queen Elizabeth class would be one Type 1046 early warning radar on the forward island, one Type 997 early warning tracking radar on the aft island, one ANSBN 41 landing radar, one Echo Foxtrot band navigational radar and two India slash Juliet band navigational radars. Additionally, the Phalanx comes with its own fire control radars, and all in all, that's the development. Stay tuned for the next video, which will be on the construction of the ships. So that's it guys, thank you very much for watching, hopefully you learned something new. Don't forget to like the video before you leave, leave a comment, and uh, give a suggestion of what you think I should do next, as well as if you have a question you want me to answer, please put it in the comment section on the pinned post. Apart from that, if you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel, I recommend doing so because I have some very interesting content coming out very soon. If you want to support the channel, there is a Patreon page, but that's entirely up to you. If you do so, there is some interesting perks to actually being a Patreon to the page. Apart from that, all you need to do is say thank you very much, have a nice day, and uh, here's a sneak peek at uh, next week's video.